If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 is where we're going to start our morning. Um, if you'd like, we're also going to visit Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And so you can turn to both of those passages, kind of keep your thumb in Matthew 28 as, as we begin. Uh, but Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Last week, we began a new series, Back to Basics, where we read about how 3,000 people, about that number, responded to Peter's first sermon. They repented, gave their lives over to Jesus, and then we took a brief look at how this new community of believers took shape. Over the next several weeks, I want to dive deep into verses 42 through uh, the end of the chapter uh, and, and to look at what this community looked like. And the purpose of this is so that we here at FAC can hold up the mirror and examine ourselves. That we can ask the question, do we, do we care about the things that we should care about? And consequently, we should also be asking the questions, do we care too much about the things that we ought not to care about? Are we focused on the basics, on the fundamentals? Are we focused on the things that we should be focused on? And what we're going to read is a description of that community life, of those first believers, the first Christian church, and we'll see that they were devoted to certain practices. And the first one that they were devoted to, which is the one we'll spend our time on this, uh, on this morning, is their devotion to the apostles' teaching. So let's go to God's word, verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. We'll read to the end of the chapter. It says this. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and all uh, had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Heavenly Father, as we look to your word now, would your spirit illuminate what's about to be said? We recognize, Father, that we are powerless without the illumination of your spirit. And so would you pour into our hearts, engage us in our minds, and let us see transformation through your word, the illumination of your word, Lord. And in your holy name I pray, amen. I was born into a uh, family of five. I'm the youngest of three brothers, or two brothers. Um, when I was introduced to my parents as, inf as an infant, I did not have the choice as to whether I was going to stick around or not. I, I did not have the luxury to replace my brothers, even though as the youngest, there were times that I wish I could. Uh, we all know what it's like to experience being born into a family. We may not remember the experience of, of birth itself, but physically we have been born into something, into uh, an organized group of people that we call the family, right? We don't have any control over it, and whether we like it or not, we have to recognize that our families have an incredible influence over our physical development, over our emotional development, over our mental development, over our spiritual development. This is an analogy that uh, a former pastor of mine would use, and it's exactly how Scripture describes membership into the family of God. It's through this spiritual birth that only comes through repentance and faith into Jesus that we are brought into a new community, which is what we talked about last week. We are brought into a new family. This is what happened when we read in verse 41 that 3,000 new believers uh, came into the family of God. They, they were brought into this new community in the same way as being born into a family physically. Scripture teaches that when we come into to this spiritual family of sorts, the family of God, we actually come in as infants. 
We come in as babies, and it is this family, it is the responsibility of the family to care for these infants and to nourish these infants. And so how does the church care and nourish the infants? How does First Alliance Church decide what to emphasize or what to prioritize in order to grow not just the baby Christians here, but also the ones who have been walking with God for decades? According to verse 42, one of the things that they did in the care of the family was that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, right off the bat, if I am a new believer or I am not a believer at all, uh, when I read that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, I've got some questions out of the gate. First of all, I'm wondering, who are these apostles and why have they been put into such a position of authority? Why specifically is their teaching the teaching that, uh, that, that we are devoted to? And my second question is just that. What are they teaching? Acts chapter 2 doesn't really tell us what they're teaching. They could be teaching algebra for all we know. And in our context, uh, that wouldn't make a difference. That would have zero impact uh, or value for us in our context. So in order to help with some of these questions, let's actually take a look at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. This passage, which is known as the Great Commission, actually answers those questions for us. So let's go ahead and take a look. Verse 18, this is what it says. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. Three weeks ago, we took a look at Acts chapter 1 and the mission that Jesus sent his disciples on before uh, before he ascended into heaven. Matthew 28 is the same event. It's a deeper look into Jesus' mission that he gave them in Acts 1. So if Acts 1 is the bare bones of this mission to go and make disciples, uh, Matthew 28 puts actually a little bit more flesh on it and how they are to go about their business. In this passage, Jesus is commissioning his disciples to do just that, make more disciples. He's saying, hey, you know what I have done with you these past three years, how I have walked with you and how I have invested in you and how I have poured my life into teaching you? You need to continue that pattern. I'm going to leave, I'm going to send you some help in the Holy Spirit, but you need to go and make disciples, follow this pattern. At this point, there was only 11 disciples, uh, because Judas, one of the 12, actually took his life after betraying Jesus, but these men are what we would call the apostles. They are identified as the apostles. Now, Now, the word apostle actually literally means to be sent out. And it makes sense, right? Because Jesus is sending them out on a mission to be messengers of Jesus, to be witnesses that Jesus did indeed die and he did indeed, he was risen from the dead. But the other way, right, there, there, there is actually, this definition could mislead us into what these apostles are or who they are because in the New Testament, there's actually two usages of the word apostle. The first one is what we just described. It's a very general term, and it refers to individuals who are sent out to be messengers of Jesus. However, there is another way that this term, apostle, is used in the New Testament, and it was to refer specifically to these 12 disciples of Jesus. You see, these men had an extremely unique and an extremely important position, Their role was unique in the sense that it's not a position that is present in the church today. It's a title that was specific to those men and only those men. It's an office that can no longer be held uh, or filled because the criteria to be an apostle of Christ was so restrictive. 
We actually see this in the latter half of Acts chapter 1 in verses 21 through 25 when the apostles are sitting around and they're discussing replacing Judas. They're saying we have to replace Judas. We need this 12th apostle. And as they discuss, they determine that the person who is to replace Judas has to meet these three criteria. And this is what they are. The first one is this. Whoever it is has to have been around for Jesus' entire ministry. He has to have been around all the way from the beginning of Jesus' ministry at his baptism to all all the way through to his ascension, which essentially marked the end of his physical ministry here on earth. If you're an apostle, you have to be here for that whole time. The, The criteria number two is they had to have witnessed the resurrected Christ. And not just see him, but they had to interact with him. They had to actually uh, be in his presence and engage with him. And criteria number three, he had to have been chosen by God himself. You see, by this criteria, nobody today qualifies. That's how unique this position was. And not only was this position unique, but it was also very important The role was so important that they have been identified as the foundation of the church with Christ as the cornerstone. That's Ephesians 2. Take a look at it in verses 19 through 20. This is what Paul writes. He's saying, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God. What Paul is saying is he is addressing a bunch of people who have come into the family of God. They have, be, they have become part of the household of God. And what is the, how, how, the foundation of the household? It is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the corner stone. We see this even fleshed out more in Revelation chapter 21. I don't have the passage up there, but if you were to look there, you would see God creating a new Jerusalem. He's creating a new kingdom, and this kingdom has 12 walls, and these 12 walls have 12 foundations, and we're told in Revelation that these 12 foundations will have the names of the 12 apostles written on the foundation. So you can see just how important these men are. You see the kind of authority that they have. Well, how on earth? How on earth did they get such authority? Why on earth should we listen to their teaching above anybody else's teaching? Well, that's where Matthew 28 answers our question. See, in our world, you can only assume a position of authority one of two ways. You can either take it by force, which obviously isn't happening here, or somebody that is in a higher position of authority can bestow authority to you. And this is what's happening in Matthew 28. Jesus is saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus' authority is the basis for the Great Commission. We're told that Jesus in his resurrected state occupies the the ultimate throne of all authority and now he is sending these men out uh, based on his own authority. So why do we listen to these men? Why do we as a Christian church devote, uh, devote ourselves to their teaching? Because by the authority of Jesus Christ who has all of the authority, he is the highest authoritative figure, has elevated these men into a position where they will speak on his behalf. We don't listen to these men based on their own authority, but based on the authority of Christ. In this unique context, to deny their authority would be to deny Jesus' authority. To to deny their teaching would be to deny Jesus' teaching. And why is that the case? Because they not only are given authority by Jesus, but they are also given the teaching of Jesus. That's the second part of the Great Commission in Matthew 28 that many people often overlook or forget about. Many people think that the Great Commission constitutes evangelism, which it does, but it's so much more than that. See, Jesus tells them the mission, go and make disciples. 
And then there's three qualifiers is, is what we would call them. It's basically Jesus saying, your mission is to make disciples. Here is how you're going to do that. First, you're going to go. Where are you going to go? You're going to go into all nations. That's how you're going to make disciples. You're going to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then, what's that final one? Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. So when we come to Acts 2, the teaching that the first Christian church devoted themselves to was not the uh, apostles teaching their own curriculum, if you will. They, They weren't pushing their own agendas or their own ideas or their own opinions. No, they are, their teaching is Jesus's teaching. They simply continued Jesus' ministry of teaching. So they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. And to do that is to to devote themselves to Jesus' teaching. And this teaching, as you'll notice in the Great Commission, isn't just for intellectual knowledge. It's not to just observe the the facts. It's not just to acquire as as much knowledge as I possibly can. No, Jesus instructs them to observe all that I have commanded you. It's not just acquiring knowledge. It is conforming my life to such knowledge. It's saying that in light of what I know, this is how I will live. This is how I will respond. What Jesus is asking his disciples to do is to go and teach other people how to live a life that is honoring and glorifying and pleasing to me. And this is what growth looks like. This is the mark of true spiritual maturity. It's being conformed. It's being molded to the teachings of Christ, to the teachings of Jesus. And this is why growth cannot happen without teaching. The scripture is often compared to as a spiritual food or a nourishment. If I do not feed my children, they will not grow. If I don't give my children healthy food, the right kind of food, they will be unhealthy. If the apostles don't feed these 3,000 new believers in Acts chapter 2 with the healthy teaching of Jesus, they will not grow spiritually. Teaching has to be present to see transformation. There has to be devotion to Jesus' teaching to see life change. Teaching is the necessary ingredient for transformation. And and, and, and the illumination of the Holy Spirit of such teaching is the catalyst for transformation and conformity. And the reason we conform and the reason we're called to conform to it is because it's authoritative. If Jesus has all the authority, that means his teaching has all authority. And if Jesus gave his teaching to the apostles, then the apostles' teaching, which that first Christian church devoted themselves to, has authority. And in due time, over the years, this teaching of Jesus, which was communicated through the apostles, took shape in written form. This is what we refer to as scriptures, as the Bible. And so in our context, our application here in the year 2019 is that the devotion to the apostles' teaching will mean submission to scripture. Scripture is the foundation of our teaching today. We come under the authoritative teaching of Jesus by submitting to his written authoritative word. And some of us are doing that, and others are not. But someday, because Jesus has all the authority in heaven and on earth, someday all of creation will eventually submit to this authoritative word. And it's important to understand that that God's word is authoritative because we live in an age when many people are challenging that notion. Many people believe there is no such thing as an authoritative word. 
We, we, there are many people that we come across every single week that submit to their own desires and satisfactions and challenge whether there is absolute authority or not. They are constantly challenging God's word. And you have to understand that this is a tactic that the devil himself has used. If, if you were to go back to the Garden of Eden, if you were to turn to Genesis 3, do you realize that the first words that the devil said to mankind are, did God really say? Did God really say that you can't eat from, from the fruit? Did God really say this? He's challenging God's word. This is why when we hear people preach and teach today, we have to evaluate its validity based on how it holds up against Scripture. All teaching must be weighed on the scale of God's Word. We don't test preachers by their popularity. We don't test preachers based on their charisma. We don't even test preachers based on how well-educated they are. We test them by the word of God. And this is why, FAC family, it is so crucial for our own health that when we stand up here and preach from this pulpit, we are called to engage ourselves with the authoritative text that is God's word and expose its truth. We need to expose its truth. That is the primary role of the preacher. It is not the preacher's job to stand up here and, and deliver a warm and fuzzy inspirational message. It's not uh, the responsibility of the preacher necessarily to make you feel good. It is the responsibility of the preacher before God to present us with God's authoritative word. Not his opinion, not his own agenda, but God's very word as if he was speaking to you himself. John Stott, he's a theologian from London. He's passed away many years ago now. There's a wonderful quote on this. He says that we have no liberty to preach a Christ of our own fantasy or even focus on our own experience. Our responsibility is to preach the authentic Christ of the scriptures and nothing else. And sometimes... Sometimes when God's word is preached, it will be inspirational. And sometimes when God's word is preached, it will be warm and fuzzy. But there are other times when God's word is preached that just like the first listeners of Peter's sermon that we looked at last week, sometimes we will be cut to the heart and things will be revealed about us that we never wished to have revealed in a thousand years. In an age where authority is challenged, we must hold fast to Scripture no matter how it makes us feel because it's authoritative. And because it's authoritative, it is timeless. If God's Word is authoritative in all matters of life, then it's not just authoritative in that specific age, but it's authoritative in all ages. It's timeless. And because it's timeless, it is always relevant. It has the same power today that it did back then. Unfortunately, there are some preachers out there who try and soup it up. They try and make it uh, relevant or timely, but they don't have to because it is by its very own nature relative, uh, relevant and timely. Why? Because it's authoritative in all matters of life at all times. And so our responsibility is not to make it more appealing. It's not to make it relevant, and it's not even to make it more palatable for our culture. Our responsibility is merely to open it up and expose the truth for what it is. But our responsibility is merely to just release it, to be able to look at the words on the page and say, here it is. Respond how you will. 
C.H. Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time, they called him the Prince of Pe- Preachers, has one of, the, one of the best excerpts on this that I've ever read that, that has just stuck with me over the years. He likens the word of God to that of a lion. And I want to read for, for you just a paragraph from, from one, of his, one of his writings. This is what he says. He says, the word of God can take care of itself and will do so if we preach it and cease defending it. See you that lion? They have caged him for his preservation, shut him up behind iron bars to secure him from his foes. See how a band of armed men have gathered together to protect the lion? What a clatter they make with their swords and spears. These mighty men are intent upon defending a lion. Oh, fools and slow of heart, open that door. Let the Lord of the forest come forth free. Who will dare to encounter him? What does he want with your guardian care? Let the pure gospel go forth in all its lion-like majesty, and it will soon clear its own way and ease itself of its adversaries. Spurgeon is saying, the word of God is like that lion. It's fierce, and it's powerful, and it's, it, it's most fierce and most powerful when you just let it out of the cage. Some people, in their approach to Scripture, they don't even realize what they're doing, but they will keep God's Word locked up in their approach to Scripture. What we need to do as a community is set it free and expose God's timeless truth in all of its glory and in all of its power and let it go to work. All we need to do is unlock the cage. God's word is authoritative. God's word is timeless. And because of that, we react the same way uh, that they did in Acts chapter 2. You might sit here and say, what's my application? What am I to know? How am I to respond? Well, the application can be found back in Acts 2, the first five words of verse 47. And they devoted themselves to. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The word they actually refers to them as one body. It's talking about the whole one entity of that community. Uh, the, the writer, Luke, isn't writing just about individuals. He's writing about the, the, the entire community. See, there's no distinctive here. He's not talking about um, just some were devoted to these things. It was all of them together. It wasn't just the apostles that were devoted to them. It's not just the the super holy ones. Uh, No, all of them, they as a group, were devoted to the apostles' teaching. I would love for this to be a defining priority of First Alliance Church. This needs to, uh, we need to reflect this characteristic. I want people who come and visit here, perhaps from out of state, to go back home and say that those people at First Alliance Church up in Erie, PA, those people, I don't care for the weather that much, but boy, are those people devoted to God's word. Boy, are those, do those people have just the highest regard for scripture. They truly devote themselves to God's word. And that word devote here in Acts 2 is very very powerful and very descriptive. To be devoted means that they made this the highest priority to be active in doing these things. This this word gives us the impression that they were, that there was persistence. Literally, it could mean that they persisted obstinately and they refused to change the course of action. These things that they devoted themselves to, the apostles' teaching being one of them, were the non-negotiables. If we do anything, we have to do these things. We have to be committed and devoted to these things. There is a lot of talk right now. I don't know if you're aware, but a lot of people believe that the American church is failing. And they, they challenge how we do church. They're suggesting that we rethink how we do church. But do we really need to rethink how we do church? No. I believe that we have to go back to the basics. Perhaps the American church is failing because we've strayed from the basics. 
Perhaps the, the church is failing because people decided to get cute and people decided to get trendy and they lost sight of the heart of biblical discipleship. Perhaps they decided to rethink church and they've strayed from the basics, from the fundamentals. As babies in Acts chapter 2, those 3,000 new believers, they didn't need something trendy. They needed God's word. And they couldn't get enough of it. They couldn't get enough of these teachings. They longed to grow and become healthy spiritual believers, so they took the necessary steps to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. And this is true in life. This is true in life. If you want to succeed in anything, you must be devoted to it. Olympians don't become Olympians unless they are devoted to their practice and preparation. You cannot be successful in business unless you are devoted to your craft. You cannot be a straight-A student unless you are devoted to certain study habits. If you want to know God... And if you want to become more like Christ, you must be devoted to learning his word. And your level of devotion to such practice will determine the depth of your spiritual growth because this is how the Holy Spirit works, through the constant and consistent exposure to scripture over time. If you were here on Easter... Uh, we showed a testimony video that saw this principle play out in the life of Becky. You have this young woman, which many of us know, uh, get up in that video and say, "I, I never knew Jesus. I didn't know Jesus. And then upon the invitation of a friend, I came to church and I heard the authoritative word of God preached. And I was intrigued. And so I went home and I opened my Bible. And I began to read, and you know what? Every day for nine months, I read scripture. I read the authoritative uh, word of God. And every week for nine months, I came back to church and heard the authoritative word of God preached. And then the lights turned on. Transformation occurred and is continuing to occur in her life. Why? Because she devoted herself over a significant period of time to the teaching of God's word. You see, some of us give up much too early. You need to keep going because the Holy Spirit works steadily over the course of time. Think about it like this. In your own life, if you have been walking with God for a while, how many sermons can you pinpoint as life-changing? How many times can you look back on your life and you say, that sermon that that preacher preached on this day at that church changed my life? There probably are some, but if we're real honest with each other, there's not many. Maybe you can count them on on one hand. So why do we keep showing up? Because we're not looking for ultimate transformation overnight. Because while the Holy Spirit can do that, and he has done that, it is the constant and consistent exposure to Scripture that transforms. In a diet, it is the constant and consistent behaviors of a healthy diet and exercise that allow you to lose weight. You have to keep at it. To see any real substantial results, you have to devote yourself to it. And just like in a diet, you won't won't see these real differences immediately because spiritual maturity happens uh, with time. As one looks in a mirror day after day, you will not see a difference in yourself physically. However, then you hop onto Facebook and a notification appears. And you have a memory from five years ago. And you click on the memory and you come to find a picture that was taken on that family vacation that you once had. And you look at yourself and you think, boy, I have grown. For me, it's growing out more than up. But there's been physical transformation nonetheless. A dramatic transformation that occurs over time. When we devote ourselves daily to the preaching of God's word and the study of God's word, spiritual transformation occurs. And once again, some of us give up much too early. 
We study our Bibles for a week, and we expect everything to change, and then we grow discouraged when it doesn't. We come to church once a month to hear God's word preached, and then we grow discouraged when it doesn't seem to be working, when God doesn't seem to be present in my life. Perhaps God isn't present in your life because you're not devoting yourself to his word, because you're not inviting him in. When we devote ourselves daily to the preaching of God's word is is when that transformation occurs. And so do not give up. Can I in good conscience sit here and say that I am devoted to the teaching of God's word? Not just that I agree with it, not that I just know it, but that I am actively engaged with it. Can we here at FAC say that we have devoted ourselves to the teaching of God's word? I can't speak on behalf of other local congregations, but the priority of First Alliance Church is not to come here and sing wonderful songs. It's not to give you interesting talks on on improving yourself. It's not even to get you through the doors so that you can be a good person. No, our priority here at First Alliance Church is to tell you about Jesus and instruct you on how to observe all that he has commanded. It's to focus on the gospel. It's to introduce people to a transformational relationship with Jesus. And that transformation can only occur in a commitment and devotion to the preaching of God's word. However, you cannot devote yourself to these teachings until you devote yourself to Jesus and his work on the cross. Have you submitted to the authority of Jesus yet? Have you submitted to the authority of Jesus or are you still blinded by your own way of life? If that is the case, How is that working for you? What does that look like? There is a treasure trove of wisdom and knowledge and and wonder and fulfillment in the pages of God's living word. But you will never see such things. You will never experience such wonders in this book until you have turned your eyes to Jesus. And so I invite you this morning, perhaps you're not getting nothing out of your time in God's word because you don't know Jesus, because if you you have yet to follow him, if that is the case, let today be the day that you decide to turn away from your own way of life and follow Jesus in his way of life. And then when you devote yourself to scripture, it will come alive. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. How good and perfect and authoritative and timeless it is. Forgive us, Father, for how we treat it. Forgive us for the times we've added to it or we've taken away from it, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for for not treating it like the treasure that it is. Lord, I pray that today you would spark, uh, that you would inspire us to know your word and to experience your word and to fall in love with your word. We thank you, Lord, that you've given it to us and that you're guiding us through it, Father. I lift up our offering to you now as we collect it, Lord. Let that be a blessing to people that don't know your word. Would you please, Father, allow us to to multiply this offering so that Jesus' name may be known and and be told about, Lord? Would you use these resources uh, and, and allow us to be stewards of these resources in a way that elevates the name of Jesus and puts him on the seat of authority and gives him all the glory? And in your holy name I pray. Amen.